Well, another month has passed and that means it is Q&A time here again on the channel. Uh, I put up a community post here on YouTube a couple of days ago to collect your questions for this video. So thank you very much to everyone who did ask one. Uh, if you're wondering how you can potentially get one of your questions answered in a future Q&A video, uh, I always uh, put up a community post a few days beforehand to collect questions for these videos. So uh, just turn notifications on for the channel, that way you'll be notified every time I upload a video, but also every time I uh, put up a new community post. And then hopefully you can get in there quick, um, ask a question and uh, I may or may not answer it on a future video. So uh, thanks to everyone who did ask a question. Uh, as usual, I'm just gonna roll the camera for a while here, see how many we can get through uh, and I hope you enjoy. So with all that said, uh, let's get into some of your Q&A questions. Okay, so first question here is from Atmos Invest. Uh, what is the current margin of safety of your portfolio? Is it something you reevaluate once a year? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So what I assume you mean by this is uh, what is sort of the market value of my portfolio versus what I think the intrinsic value is. So, you know, on average of the companies in the portfolio trading at 70 cents on the dollar or 50 cents on the dollar or a dollar on the dollar. Um, that is something that I have looked at from time to time. I haven't evaluated it recently, so I don't know what it is exactly off the top of my head. Um, but there's been probably two points throughout um, my own investing where uh, I've felt that more or less every company in my portfolio, with the exception of maybe one, um, which is generally Berkshire Hathaway, um, just for full disclosure, where I felt that um, pretty much every stock in my portfolio could have close to doubled, or in some cases more than doubled and still not been at intrinsic value. And that has really only happened a couple of times. Once was in 2020 and once was actually late last year, probably almost exactly 12 months ago. Um, and from those points forward over, say, the next year, those have actually been some of the um, better time periods for me in terms of returns. So maybe it is something I should track a little more closely, um, but I don't know exactly what that is uh, off the top of my head. I believe it was uh, Nick Sleep, I want to say, tracked this fairly closely in some of his... Um, early years running the Nomad partnership. I might be wrong on exactly that person, but I think it was Nick Sleep. Maybe people can let me know down in the comments below. Um, so it is an interesting kind of idea to keep track of at the same time, whether it would actually change my actions in terms of how I manage the portfolio, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I'm always on the lookout for undervalued securities, undervalued stocks. Um, maybe it would make me more inclined to sell companies as they got closer to intrinsic value rather than just hanging on to them. But I'm trying to get towards high quality businesses I can hold for a long time anyway. So yeah, there's a few thoughts for you on that question. Um, but that's a very good one. Thanks for the question. Next one here is from Al Dighty. Uh, would you ever consider uh, either starting your own business or farm uh, or buying one like Jack? Uh, yeah, I don't see myself ever being a farmer, but um, you, you never know. I do, I do work in the industry, but um, I don't see myself going down that path. Uh, starting my own business or, or buying one like uh, Jack, Jack Duffley has done. Uh, yeah, that's something I'm very open to. I mean, this YouTube channel is sort of like a little side business for me. I still work a full-time job, but, um, you know, it's a very helpful side income, I must say, at this point. Um, so thank you to everyone who watches the videos. That is uh, very helpful for me personally. Um, but would I ever consider, you know, starting some other type of business or buying one? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely would. Um, and probably the past six or eight months, I've been keeping more of an eye on sort of local businesses for sale and that sort of thing in my area. Um, yeah, yet to look super closely at any of them. It's sort of just to kind of see what's out there at this point, but it's certainly something I'm very open to. Um, I'm getting to a point now where I have a sort of a reasonable capital base. You know, I'm not just one or two years out of university and trying to pay off a student loan or anything like that. Um, so we are in a position where we could, you know, maybe buy a little small business if we wanted to, or I can keep allocating to stocks. There's obviously pros and cons to both. As a very general rule uh, with private businesses, you're going to be much more involved in obviously the day-to-day -day operations, particularly if it's a very small private business um, where you don't have a lot of staff and you don't have management in place and that kind of thing. Um, but the trade-off is you should be able to buy them cheaper 
then you can buy, you know, the average public company. Um, but obviously the average public company you can get out of in a second if you change your mind or if it turns out you're wrong on the investment. Private businesses, that's much, much more difficult to do. So there's pros and cons to both. Um, and to answer your question, I'm... Um, I'm sort of uh, steadily getting to grips with the idea and um, starting to just look generally at what's out there. Next question is from ABCDEFG <laughs> to write down your investment thesis before buying. Uh, yes, I definitely do. I have become um, pretty regimented in how I do this these days. Uh, I have a pretty structured investment checklist, a pre-investment uh, checklist. Uh, I've actually got a video here on the channel uh, going through an example company with that checklist. Um, that checklist will evolve over time. It's personal to me. Uh, my checklist shouldn't be the same as your checklist because you will miss things that I won't and I will miss things that you won't. We're all kind of... Um, you know, we all tend to make different types of mistakes and that type of thing as investors. But um, yeah, as I work through that checklist, I'm putting notes kind of against each point. You know, there's checklist items in there like can I lay out the key kind of metrics or KPIs that I need to um, keep track of and monitor for this business to make sure it remains on track with my investment thesis over time. And I'll write down quite specific information in there. So um, I, yeah, I guess as a result of going through that checklist, I'm, I'm definitely writing down the investment thesis. And it's been really useful to look back at those um, checklists that I'm just kind of saving in Excel spreadsheets. Um, it's been really good to look back at those over time. And, um, you know, if I I've still own that stock after a couple of years has my um, kind of investment thesis drifted a bit from where my thinking was first at or are we still mainly on track it's a good way to uh, kind of keep myself in check on that front as well so yes I definitely uh, write down the investment thesis in that way before I buy a stock um, yeah highly recommend it to anyone else who um, wants to wants to get better as an investor over time Okay, next question is from B. Weezy. Hey Tom, uh, I have a lot, but always forget to ask them here. Have you read Nick Sleep's Nomad Partnership Letters? I read them following Modish's recommendation and I couldn't put them down once I started. Also, if you have read them, could you share something you walked away with after finishing them? One thing I found incredibly interesting was how they thought of successful companies moving forward along their decision trees into time. Uh, thanks, Tom, and keep up the great work. Thank you very much, and good question. Uh, I have not read all the Nomad Partnership letters. I've read, I think, the first two years is probably about it at this point. Um, I've watched lots of people make videos on their learnings from the Nomad Partnership letters, and I've also heard Monish talk about it. So um, I guess I've got a bit of exposure, you know, to uh, Nick Sleep and uh, Zach, his, his partner, through that. Uh, I've also read Rich Was a Happier, and there's a full chapter on uh, Nick and Zach uh, in that book as well. So I guess main learnings I've had from them, they um, very clearly evolved uh, in terms of their investing approach over time. They started out investing in very cheap, um, kind of lower quality companies like a lot of value investors do. I think they were buying uh, like cement companies in Zimbabwe and things like that. And they obviously evolved over time to basically owning Amazon Berkshire and uh, Costco, you know, all in size. I think some of the main learnings for me, um, the scale economy shared kind of business model is a really interesting approach that I hadn't really um thought about too much before Nick and Zach. Um, so that's been a helpful kind of mental framework to add to my add to my mental tool belt, I suppose. Uh, the other thing is destination analysis. Um, is an idea that I've heard Guy Spear talk about, and I think he actually got that from Nick Sleep. So I'm um, thinking about where a business can potentially be in five or 10 years. And, you know, if the business can get from point A today to that point B in five or 10 years, what's that look like in terms of, you know, cash flows for the company and returns for me as an investor? So that also has been a really good framework, um, not only for looking at higher quality companies, but potentially for steering away from lower quality companies are uh, doing that destination analysis type thinking has been really helpful um, and the other thing that really stands out for uh, Nick and Zach and the Nomad partnership is that they were very concentrated and were able to you know with having that destination analysis framework in mind just hold on to the same companies for a long period of time and and let's 
those businesses do their thing. You know, year after year would go by and there would be very, very few transactions in their fund. Uh, and for them, that was significant value add to their investors just kind of laying back and doing nothing. So uh, not the typical, you know, um, like high frequency trader image you have when the average person thinks of a hedge fund. So um, very cool approach to see there. Next question from at Value Hunter Investing. Uh, recommendations for sites with NZX data. QuickFS and Ticker seem to lack data or have incorrect data. Um, yeah, some New Zealand and some Australian companies that are quite small can have pretty uh, limited data on a lot of websites. Um, frankly, I think it's probably best just to go direct to their investor relations page. I haven't really found anything... Um, that has filled that gap i suppose like if um if data is kind of limited on ticker it's usually limited on a lot of other platforms as well um so yeah i don't have great answers for you on that one unfortunately it's a challenge i run into as well looking at our little new zealand companies so um good question though and if anyone uh, has uh, recommendations for where you can get good data on smaller companies without kind of just going straight to the filings uh, that would be useful but you know one of the reasons there's often a lot of opportunity in smaller companies is because people don't take the time to look because they you know don't screen well or whatever so um, it's potentially you know both a blessing and a curse uh, from an investment perspective Okay, next question here is from Aman Preet. Hi Tom, uh, what would you recommend to do when I can't find a bargain in my circle of competence? Um, yeah, good question, and we've got a reply here uh, from uh, from a subscriber to that question, saying way to look internationally. Um, yeah, I guess uh, just backing up a step at a very high level, what I'm personally trying to do with my investing, not to say this is exactly what you should do with your investing but what i'm trying to do is build up um, a portfolio of um, either okay quality businesses that are very cheap or good quality businesses um, you know and high quality businesses that are reasonable price i'm trying to build up a portfolio of those over time uh, and i'm not in a major rush to go out and buy like a basket of 10 or 15 stocks that fit those couple of criteria you know tomorrow or anything i do very much subscribe to warren buffett's sort of punch card approach where you know if you only have uh, 20 potential investments you can make in your lifetime you will think very hard before you make each individual new investment so you know if you're going to be investing for the next 30 or 40 years for example uh, you don't need to find 10 stocks tomorrow if you find one stock a year and um, you know each year you're making a single very high quality decision um, that can work out pretty well over time in those early years you're going to be pretty concentrated in a small in a small number of companies you will make mistakes along the way and some of those companies will leave the portfolio for whatever reason um, but over time if you're able to repeat that process you you should build up a reasonable portfolio so um yeah the the way i do it if i can't find a bargain in my circle of competence um i keep saving cash and keep looking <laughs> pretty much is the answer um i don't have a major silver bullet uh for you there if you do want to take the you know value investing type approach um obviously there's other options if you don't want to be a value investor you know there's index funds um are a very popular option for a lot of people and so on um you know, I can't make specific recommendations or anything like that, but that's the approach I, I generally take as I just be patient and keep looking. I build up a watch list of companies that I do like, um, even if they don't quite meet the price criteria. And, you know, hopefully one day I do get a chance to buy a few of those watch list type companies as well. Okay, next question is from Yiani. Uh, Hi Tom, thank you for consistently creating high quality videos. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question around the VIE structure that facilitates foreign ownership of Chinese businesses. We all know that the value of any business is the present value of all the future cash flows discounted at an appropriate rate. However, if the CCP just decides that they don't uh, want such a structure in place anymore and ban the structure, you'd experience a complete loss of capital as a foreign investor. I know that this is a low probability event, but still it would completely wreck someone's portfolio. How do you think about this type of situation? Uh, I don't think I'd be comfortable projecting cash flows, which I may or may not have access to in future regards. Uh, very good question. Uh, there are very real political risks around um, some of these Chinese businesses, uh, Alibaba, Pinduoduo, JD.com, Tencent, etc., etc. 
Um, yeah, if the VIE structure were to be banned or something, um, there's a very real chance that some of these companies can go to zero. And if you have it as a large position in your portfolio, it could see it, it could certainly wreck someone's portfolio, like you say. Um, so position sizing is going to be very important. You know, you want to um, live another day in terms of your investing should things go wrong. Um, in terms of the probability of that happening, it's I, I don't know, honestly. Um, I don't think anybody knows. Um, you've said here it's it's likely a low probability event. There'll, there's people out there that'll argue there's no chance of that happening and there's other people that'll argue that it's actually a high probability event. It just kind of depends where you land um, on that spectrum. So um, yeah, in terms of projecting out future cash flows for the business, I still think that's a very good way to go about valuing any business. And I don't think the Chinese companies are any exception. Um, but I think you have to size it in your portfolio in a way that you think is appropriate for you, given some of the political risks. Um, you know, if you think these companies are really undervalued and you buy them and things work out well over time, uh, you want to be in a position to hopefully benefit from that because your analysis is right. And, you know, you put some capital at risk to try and capture that opportunity, but you don't want to put so much capital at risk that, um, you know, if they are a zero and you get wiped out, um, well, you just don't want that to happen. You don't want to get wiped out in terms of your portfolio. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a very individual decision. A lot of people will just choose to pass on those companies altogether, given the potential wipeout risks. Um, some people will land on the idea that the risk reward makes sense. That's really up to you to, to, do, to do the work and come to a conclusion for yourself on it. For example, on some of the recent Alibaba earnings videos that I've made, um, there's been some really good comments about, you know, uh, sure, these businesses might look undervalued, but the political risks are very high. You know, there were a lot of people that thought Russian businesses were extremely undervalued two or three years ago, and they, they might have potentially been right. You know, those companies were throwing off a lot of cash flow or had a lot of assets relative to their price. But, um, you know, if you can't own the stock and you you get completely wiped out, it really doesn't matter what the results of the businesses are. So, um, yeah, there's certainly risks to consider and, um, you know, you got to allocate to your portfolio in a way that you think is appropriate for you. Okay, next question is from Matthias. Hi, uh, from the UK. Excellent videos. Thank you. Uh, thank you for making them. I <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, as someone who has really high energy, I have to do other things to forget about my investments uh, or, I will, or I will get too impatient. How do you enforce passivity on yourself? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> I think, to be honest, I have a personality to where I'm I'm a very patient person most of the time, uh, and that probably flows over to my investments. So I don't feel a particular need to take action if prices are jumping all over the place um, or if business results are jumping all over the place. I will consider that much more seriously than just price movements. Um, but I'm not someone that feels compelled to have to act all the time. Um, I think something like an investment checklist, even for me, um, as a someone who's already pretty patient, having the investment checklist has slowed me down a lot. So that's definitely something you could put in place if you haven't already. Um, but you know, I think you just kind of have to invest in a way that matches your personality. You know, maybe you do have a big chunk of your portfolio that you want to have set in place and you just want to own these businesses for a long time. Uh, and maybe you have to take a smaller chunk of your portfolio, like five or 10%. And maybe you just say to yourself, I'm going to allow myself to be a bit more active in this small chunk of the portfolio. Um, you know, I know some people that do that. Uh, I think Jason Rothman from the After Dinner Investor is someone who uh, kind of keeps himself entertained in a way in his portfolio with uh, these merger workout type situations. But then he still has, you know, the big uh, core positions that remain relatively unchanged, um, you know, over time. So um, you got to find a strategy that works for you. Um, for me, it's been investment checklists. For others, it might be having a small sort of more risky business type chunk of the portfolio as uh, Phil Town would call it, um, who's another investor that, you know, has a small chunk of his portfolio that he allows himself to um, be a bit more risk seeking with. So um, there's a couple of thoughts for you. Okay, let's take one last question. This is from Jared Collins. 
Uh, I know we track super investor portfolios through 13F filings, but have you found any place that tracks and aggregates their actual annual returns and investment performance? Uh, yeah, very good question. I think Whale Wisdom attempts to do some of that. Uh, but again, it's going to be just with uh, 13F data and it's just going to be, you know, the dates where 13Fs are reported. So uh, 13Fs are great in a sense. They give us US stocks that these investors own. Uh, they tell us the quarter in which they own them. They, you know, tell us how many shares and the market value at the time, given the number of shares they disclose in their 13Fs. But they don't tell us, uh, you know, whether they're shorting stocks, whether they've got cash, whether they've got international investments. They don't even tell us, you know, the exact price that these investors bought or sold those particular stocks at. It just tells us what do they own at the end of each quarter. And, you know, for that reason, it's really tough for us to calculate the actual returns that these people experience. Um, so the best place I've found to go if they're at all accessible is to those particular investors, you know, annual reports and their funds. So uh, Guy Spear, for example, now makes his letters available. Um, I don't think Monish Probri does, but they occasionally do float around online. And I've seen uh, a few of the a few of them over the years, but I'm not getting regular quarterly updates or anything like that. Um, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway is pretty easy because um, they've got a very clean record. You just have to look at Berkshire's annual report each year and it'll tell you, you know, how they've performed against the S&P 500. But unfortunately, we're just not going to be able to get all of that data for every investor. Uh, Lee Lu, for example, is someone that uh, I've really struggled to get, you know, actual investment return kind of data on in recent years. Uh, I know there were stats floating around from 10 or 15 years ago, for example, but um, that's obviously not giving us the full picture of his sort of career to date. So like I say, I think Well Wisdom tries to do a bit of that, but uh, it's definitely not perfect. And if you can source the actual investors, um, you know, real report out of their fund, that is going to be, you know, the gold standard. So those are all the questions we have time for today. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. And for anyone that did ask a question, I really appreciate uh, the great questions that came through. Apologies if I didn't get to your question. Uh, if you get in there quick for next month's q and I will do my best to get to it. Uh, like I said at the start of the video, just turn notifications on for the channel. Uh, that way you should be notified when I put up my next community post to collect questions for next month's monthly Q&A. Um, but that's it for this one, and I'll see you on the next video. Cheers.